Welcome back to the Messy Reformation. My name's Jason Rice. I'm the lead pastor at Faith Community CRC in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin. My co-host is Willie Cronkey. He's a member at Pease CRC in Pease, Minnesota. We're just a couple of guys who love the Christian Reformed Church and want to see Reformation happen in our denomination. But we realize that whenever Reformation happens in the history of the church, things get messy. And after this past synod, and looking forward to this next synod, things are really starting to get messy in the Christian Reformed Church. So we're taking the opportunity to have conversations with pastors throughout the Christian Reformed Church to find out what's going on in our denomination, but also to talk about what Reformation might look like. If you haven't already, take a moment, click subscribe so you don't miss any of our upcoming content. We're dropping episodes every single Sunday evening. We also want to say thank you to everyone who sponsored us on Patreon We're slowly making our way to our modest goal of 20 sponsors at $5 a month. So if you appreciate what we're doing and want to help us continue to put out content, head on over to patreon.com slash the messy reformation. You can also support us for free by sharing our content. I'm a terrible self-marketer and everyone knows that now, so I need your help. If you know of anyone who would benefit from listening to this content, let them know about the messy reformation. With all that said, we're going to get to this week's episode, which is part two of our conversation with Matt Vandenhavel and David Swinney. One of the challenges in doing that these days is that people don't have the depth of theological, biblical understanding that they used to have. I remember going to visit people early on, you know, people who were elderly then, um, 25 years ago, and talking with them, and it was very clear, you can talk, you can bring up a passage like, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, and they don't find that offensive, they find it encouraging, Um, where now, you know, oftentimes people will say, well, don't go to the bedside in the hospital and quote what Lord's Day one in the catechism. That's just trite. And it doesn't, you know, I'm like, no, um, a story from my first church, I guess there were some people, um, it was a, a, a more of an immigrant church, post-war immigrant church in Winnipeg. So if you were older than me, then you spoke Dutch as a first language. And as people, I'm not Dutch, I don't speak Dutch, I've never even been to the Netherlands. Um, how I got into a Christian Reformed Church is um, proof, of, proof of the providence of God. Of God. <laughs> but um, but uh, there were people who, when they would get Alzheimer's or dementia, would lose their English and they couldn't speak English anymore. So I, I could only go along as an observer on the visit. I had an elder who could speak to them in their birth language and, and he would go visit them. And I was so impressed when we would sit in the hospital or a care home with somebody who no longer recognized their spouse. Um, but he would ask in Dutch, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And they'd just rattle off that answer that I am not my own, but belong body and soul and life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And they go all the way to the end of it. And uh, I thought, you know, when I get to that point where it's me on the other side, you know, lying in the bed and and Matt's there visiting me, um, if I don't remember who he is, but I can remember that I belong body and soul and life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, then that's enough. That that's that's good, and it's in preaching. And I'm even we're we're, we're moving towards. I hope in in our congregation of sort of reinstituting the catechism service. Mm-hmm. Um, I really want to bring that back. I think it was important. I think it's it, it was sad when the CRC decided to let it go, um, because there's all that theological foundation that previous generations had that I don't see in younger people. And so visiting people who don't have that when you go to the hospital, it's it's like you're starting from scratch, where when you go to see them and they've got that foundation and they understand really what that means, 
that I belong to God, body and soul, and life and in death, that everything must work together for my salvation. You know, Lord's Day 10, nothing comes by chance, but everything from the hand of a loving father. The people who understand that, mm-hmm. visiting them in the hospital, they usually send you away with a greater blessing than what you could ever give to them. That's yeah. my experience anyway. Yeah, and I want to, I'll throw another two stories in on, on top of that. I remember... Um, Cause I got some of that counseling advice for pastoral care classes to like, don't come in and beat them over the head with it. And obviously you're not going to beat anybody over the head, but, um, but I remember we, uh, Willie and I were in the same church for a while and there was a man in our congregation who, who taught catechism for a very long time. He, every, every young adult and 30 year old in our church had been taught catechism from this man. And, uh, and he was still teaching the teenagers when I was there. And, and at some point, I forget exactly when it was, but his daughter was murdered in almost like kind of some gang violence down in the, in the Twin Cities. And, uh, and at her funeral, as, as the teenagers are going through the line and, and hugging him, he looked at him and said, what's our only comfort in life and in death? Mm. Um, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a trite thing. It wasn't, I mean, that is, he was reminding himself and the teenagers in that moment, this is our only comfort. Even when my daughter just got murdered in cold blood, um, our only comfort is that, you know, we belong body and soul and life and in death to our faithful savior, Jesus Christ. And, and even just me personally, you know, uh, you know, everybody who listens to this podcast or a lot of people who listen to this podcast know of my own health experience in the last few years, you know, I was in a coma for two weeks and, and all of that. And, uh, and all of the scriptural foundation that I had leading into that on the one hand, you know, when I was told, all right, we're going to intubate you and you have like a 50% chance of living. Um, the passage that ran through my mind was the passage that you just quoted for me to live as Christ, for me to die as gain. If I'm to go on living, you know, if I'm to be with Christ, that is great. But if I'm to go on living, it's going to be joy for you. And I'm like, okay, Lord, if I'm going to die, I guess I, I'm going to be in your presence. I get to enjoy that. And if you have work for me to do, I'm going to continue to live. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then when I laid in the hospital bed, I couldn't even read. I was so weak. My wife, because God gave me a really good wife, came in and uh, and had what started playing uh, Shane and Shane songs, which are just basically the Psalms. Um, and so I was just listening to God's word over and over and over in the hospital bed. And that's what gave me hope and peace and, and comfort in that moment. And so I, I get really frustrated <laughs> when I hear people say, don't come in with the Bible in that moment. Just listen. No, that's the only thing we have to give people hope. Be be wise. Don't be a jerk. Be, you know, but but that's what we have to give people in those moments. And then going back, I guess, to preaching and the importance of good reformed biblical preaching is, is that hopefully we're not only preaching in the time of crisis of people's lives, right? Uh, because you learned your good theology outside of the crisis, mm-hmm. right? And, and, and so you're prepared and you're ready for when the crisis comes, your good, solid biblical reformed theology is all right there for the blessing. Amen. Right? That, that's what pulls us through. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I remember John Piper once said, this was early on in my ministry and it has stuck with me. He said, your job as a pastor is to prepare your people to suffer. Yeah. That's your job. Well, and uh, back to what you were saying earlier, equipping, right? It, it, you're equipping not for like, you're not like throwing them a sword in the middle of battle, hopefully you're, you're mm-hmm. giving them their sword and teaching them how to use it so that when they're in battle, right? Like this is to equip. You equip your soldiers before you go into war. You don't equip them when they're in war. Right. And and I think that's what a lot of preaching is, is, is the equipping. It is the preparing. It's, it's teaching them also how to even study their Bible. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's important. You can't. Yeah. That's great. Well, I think that's one of the big benefits of expository preaching. Yes. Um, is you, you, you're showing them how to read their Bibles every week. That's yeah. what you're doing. You're saying, here's how you read this. And did you notice this word? And, uh, and did you notice this? And here's how these fit together. And, and you're really teaching them. Then when your people go back and they, on the one hand, they reread the passage that you preached on. They're like, whoa, I see this in a different light now because of 
all of the way, but then they start reading and then they start paying attention to these certain words and these phrases and how they get together. So just, just the fact of doing expository preaching is equipping your people to learn how to read God's word. And also with expository preaching, you'll end up sometimes repeating yourself a bit, right? As you go through a a letter or a book, a gospel or whatever, you're going to see certain themes. They just keep coming up. And, and, and it's like, oh man, should I say some of the same stuff that I said three Sundays ago? Well, I think I need to, because, well, Paul said the same thing multiple times. Why, why did God carry him along in such a way to make sure that this point got nailed so hard because we need it nailed so hard. Like, like, you know, if you're expositorily preaching, uh, one big theme that should be coming up in a lot of the sermons is for the glory of God. Like it, it's actually for his name's sake. It's, it's for his purpose, his glory. You're not the ends in yourself. It's for God. I mean, if people are sitting under expository preaching, they're realizing that they're not the point of it all. Mm-hmm. That God's the whole point. Um, and, and, and it's like, well, I'm not going to do a sermon series on why God's the point. I'm going to do a sermon series through a, a, a section of scripture or a whole book or letter or whatever. And that's going to drive home that point <laughs> because that's just what happens. Um, and, you know, for the praise of his glory, you know, it, it's all about him. Um, uh, yeah. And, and I guess, so when you preach like that, that you end up preaching principles rather than a quick tool that it's like, I can put this into use this week, right? It's like, hey, give everybody some homework for just this week to do. Um, and uh, it, if we're teaching principles, then they have those principles at the ready for when they need them uh, in their life so that they can respond appropriately in the moment. I used to be a youth pastor uh, youth director, I suppose I should say more appropriately before I got into, uh, went back to school and everything and got into seminary and then became a preacher, uh, pastor. And, uh, I would go to some of the youth conferences and, uh, and, and some of the talks were more like, Hey, here's like seven techniques to do such and such. And then some of them were more principles oriented. And I would like be so annoyed by these principles oriented ones because I just wanted to come back this week with that new fun game to lead with my kids. Like that's what I wanted. I just wanted the tangible thing just to pull. And uh, as I matured, I realized no, actually the principle stuff is the better thing because out of that flows, flows the ability to do ministry. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I think that it's important to see the sermons that way too. yeah yeah you give just recently like i i preach in um three different uh seniors care homes as well as a church so i do that a fair bit and often i will try to just pull some part of the sermon i preach on sunday most care homes don't want you preaching for 45 minutes in addition to the songs you're going to lead. So I try to pull a piece of it and uh, just giving people that biblical foundation, that place to stand. So recently I was in um, three different care homes and did the same basic message in each one from uh, the high 90s in the Psalms. You find the repetition of the phrase, the Lord reigns. Um, several times right through that that section of the Psalms. And so even with these elderly people, as we're talking about all the things that are happening, that was the Chinese spy balloon, you know, all the things that were going on. And so I'm asking these older folks, you know, how many of you watch the progress of the spy balloon and various other things, the, the earthquake in Turkey and terrible things that are happening in the world? Um, I said, but here's here's the thing. Scripture tells us, the Lord reigns. And then, you know, you talk about something, a little tool they can take with. I said, that's your homework. Memorize those three words. And you have memorized the beginning of about five different Psalms in the middle of another one. Um, The Lord reigns. And you you go out and you sit down and the person sitting next to you at supper is, oh, I'm so worried about it. The the world's just such a terrible place. What are we going to do? So, well, then you turn to them and say, yeah, I understand 
but the Lord reigns. Um, and, and to take that as your foundation, when you're going to the hospital, you know, I'm going to the hospital and uh, I don't know how this diagnosis, what's going to happen, like you were telling in your own story. Um, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but the Lord reigns. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is King of Kings. Um, he, he rules over He's all things, you know, by the word of his power. Um, he is working all things according to the counsel of his own will. Um, I think preaching has to give people that place to stand so that when you step into that crisis at some point, they're not hearing this, what do you mean for, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain? That, that's easy for you to say. You're not the one lying here in the bed, you know? And if that's the case, if they've never got that foundation, then maybe that's true to a certain extent, and you're, you're sort of going back to square one and starting over. But if they have that foundation, um, there's an older lady in our church who uh, has not really been able to come out since COVID. So it's been a long time since she was able to come to church. But she's one of those saints who she'll call me from time to time or I'll go visit her at home. And she'll start off with a little bit of a melancholy, ah, I'm not feeling so good. It's, you know, and but she's also one of those saints where it takes 30 seconds where you just give her that little bit of scripture and suddenly her, her entire demeanor changes mm. and she's praising the Lord and being thankful for all of the blessings that she has. And, you know, just a complete turnaround just by giving her that one little piece of scripture. And it's not because any one little piece of scripture is going to do that. It's because she's got that foundation mm. where, yeah, I really do know most of everything I need to know in terms of, of Christ and, and, you know, just, just give me that little piece of hope in this moment and that will change, that will change everything. Um, I think of uh, Lamentations 3 where Jeremiah is running through that horrible, depressing list of everything that he sees in the world that's wrong all around him. And then he stops and says, yet this I call to mind. And therefore, I have hope. And when somebody has that theological, biblical background, all you have to do is give them the opportunity to call this to mind, and their outlook can change in a second. And, and I think what we're doing from the pulpit from week to week is giving them that foundation in scripture and in theology that they can take on. It equips them, like you were saying earlier equips them to go out and do the work of the ministry. It equips them to go out and face whatever challenges they're going to be facing, you know, in the week to come based on this solid foundation of God's word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Matt and David, thank you guys just so much for um, your labor in proclaiming God's word faithfully. Um, I'm kind of wondering maybe for some listeners here who are feeling that they maybe don't hear the proclamation that you guys are so passionate and em emphatic about on this podcast, that they're not hearing this in their Lord's Day services. Um, how do you think you could provide encouragement kind of to them through what you're saying right now? Oh, I got a few ideas. <laughs> I remember, I think it was in um, the autobiography of Spurgeon, um, he talked about uh, going to a little state church out in the country somewhere, and um, the sermon that was being preached, he just, it, it did not edify, it did not build up, there was, there was nothing there. But there was a, an older lady in the church that he spoke to, if I'm remembering this story correctly, and read this a long time ago, and he said, well, how do you continue to come here from week to week to week and, and, you know, stay strong in your faith. And she said, well, simple, everything he says, I just take the opposite <laughs> as true. <laughs> that's, one that's one possibility. But I think there's so many, we have so much opportunity today that I didn't even have when I was a young adult, 
to, you know, there, there's a lot of negative things about the internet, but you have the opportunity to listen to some of the most remarkable preachers that have ever been. We, we're not limited to what we can hear. Old and yeah, old yesterday's and sermon. Um, we're not limited to what we can hear on Sunday morning in our own congregation, which is important, yeah. but we can listen to, you know, recordings of great preachers who've been gone for years now, and we can listen to, you know, online services from pastors all over the place. And, and you got to be careful and discerning mm -hmm. in doing that. But I think um, it's not hard to find some ministries where the word is being preached faithfully and you're going to grow as a result of listening. Um, so and I, th I think it also depends on the unique circumstance, right? So, okay. So are, are the sermons just maybe just not good or are the sermons wrong? Right. So that, that matters greatly. Um, is the church generally speaking a good and a faithful church? And this is obviously in the context where the preaching isn't perfect, right? So when the preaching is not, well, not perfect, but not good, right? So it's either not good because they're just not well done, but they're generally orthodox, right? Or when they're, you know, maybe even good or not good and also wrong, right? Misleading. So I think there's two different categories there. In the case of things are actually wrong, uh, and, and the church is, is in a wrong spot, um, I, then you have to say, hey, what's my circle of influence? How much influence do I have into this, right? If this is a big, massive church, I think you still have some level of, of influence and you can write a letter. If you can, if you can write a letter to the prime minister and, and, and it actually have some matter of factness, I mean, if, if the church is like, say, a thousand people, um, you writing a letter to encourage more faithfulness in this church would still be a good thing. Say, this is what we need. We need a pure word of God preached. We got some soapbox preaching going on or, you know, call out the specific thing and, and try to be an agent of change if you've got that level of influence within it. Um, and if you've exhausted your level of influence and nothing has changed, then I would say get into a place where the true preaching of the word is happening, right? I mean, I, I earlier I quoted from what are the three marks of a true church? Well, if you've got pure preaching of the word, well, if you don't have pure preaching of the word, you're actually not in church, mm -hmm. right? So go get to a church, um, but don't leave your church without first trying to exert the level of godly influence that you have first. Uh, and, and so uh, I would say that if you're in that setting, if for some reason you can't actually leave it then at least be filled with some great preaching that you are able to get uh, via the internet, right? To augment. I would also add, I think Matt touched on this a little bit, but I've heard some really amazing sermons in terms of content that were presented by people who, for one reason or another, they weren't the easiest people to listen to. And I think we have to learn to listen for content, not style. Mm -hmm. um, there's some really flashy, exciting public speakers out there that have nothing whatsoever to say. And there are some guys who've been faithfully plotting away, <laughs> preaching God's word for decades, maybe. And in terms of style, it's not the most amazing thing you're ever going to hear. But in terms of content, you've got a sermon that comes from God's word through a heart that's been transformed by God's word and sometimes through a lot of painful experience that maybe comes out in this. But, but listening is part of the process of preaching the gospel is learning to listen to the gospel. Yeah. And listening not for, was that a peppy little outline that I can repeat five minutes later, you know, but listening for the substance of what's being preached. And, and that that's the that's the other side, right? So the one side is when you're in a church where um, maybe the, the the sermon is really engaging or it's not engaging, but it's just wrong, right? So you got a a, a a basically bad preaching, bad church, and then try to exert influence. But the other side is okay. So you're just not it, the the sermons aren't as great. Um, I 
yeah, you have to ask yourself, why aren't they great? Because uh, I will say, by the way, if if the person is not a great preacher, but they're preaching from the scripture, even the bad unscriptural sermons still sometimes have a text printed out that if you're sitting through the time of the of a servant sermon and you haven't heard the word of God, that's your fault. Because just open the Bible in front of you. If the guy's just going off, read your own Bible and meditate on that. Right. Uh, you know, you've got that time. You're actually sitting down for 20 to 20 minutes to 60 minutes. Um, if you've got the word of God in front of you, please tell me why you can't be transformed sitting there for that long somehow. Right. So that's on you to get something out of that time. Um, but uh, I also be patient sometimes with these pastors who, uh, you know, aren't, uh, you know, as engaging or in rapping, uh, cause may, maybe they're a younger preacher trying to learn their way. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, I've had my seasons of growth. I'm still not the best preacher, um, but I'm better than what I used to be. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and so people have had patience for me, even in uh, a, a sermon series, which has otherwise been a great sermon series. I'll have a couple of sermons where it's like, I don't know, but somehow God ends up using those sermons, which is awesome. But, um, you know, having that grace for your preacher, don't judge them by the way that the world tells you to judge a sermon, by the way. Uh, but um, there's also the possibility of, uh, you know, so David and I, we work together a lot on our sermons. It's possible that this person could, you know, do something similar. This pastor could do something similar. And maybe there's an encouragement to say, hey, uh, um, I heard about a pastor duo where they work together. They have totally different churches and different sermons, but they work together through the week. Um, you know, I wonder, it depends on how much, I guess, you know, the pastor and if you can speak into that pastor's life. Um, I'll also say though, too, that, um, uh, this can work out as well, uh, even without a pastor a friend to work through. Uh, we've we've had some people in my church, for example, who have maybe been between jobs. We just invite them along to our like hammering out the text. A lot of times we do it on Tuesdays and they just hang out with us for the day as we just pound through the text, as we try to figure out what what that passage is trying to say. Um, and that's good. And maybe uh, maybe if he doesn't have a pastor to work with, maybe it's some a person or two from the congregation that, you know, could just sit with that pastor and, and pound through that text a little bit and ask those questions. And, and it could be a blessing to that pastor. And, and that style might not at all work for that pastor. Um, and so you got to be patient if that style doesn't work. I would say that the thing that David and I do, uh, it works for us. It really, it, it mm-hmm. does. But it, I, I could see this not working for everybody the way that they, they do it. But yeah. Yeah, patience. Well, you yeah, amen. I want to I want to touch on one thing, and then uh, we're we're kind of coming to the end. But but you guys already brought this point up a little bit, and I want to I want to hear you guys talk about it a little bit more. For those, um, I guess it goes from either way. We have people listening to this podcast who are pastors who are preaching every week, and we have people listening to this podcast who are elders and deacons and and lay people who are listening to people preaching. What as a pastor, as you're writing a sermon, what would you say should be their goal for a good sermon? And then as someone sitting in the pew, what should they be listening to, to evaluate whether a sermon is good or not? Yeah. Um, uh, what should be the goal of the preaching? I, I would say uh, is to, uh, I, I, uh, I got to sit under Haddon Robinson's uh, teaching and uh, at Gordon Conwell Seminary, and um, one of the big things for preaching is is to basically explain, prove, and apply. Mm-hmm. Explain, prove, and apply what? Well, the passage. Um, and so, uh, I I seek to, or we seek to, once we've got that pericope, that passage that we're going to be preaching, uh, we try to lay aside our our pre-understandings of that passage uh, to, to say, what's this passage saying? To try to study it, to understand it, 
Uh, so that that would get into the idea of explaining, right? Uh, what what does this passage say? What's what's being said in this passage? And then uh, you know uh, you know maybe you could argue, do you need to do the proof part? But I, I think sometimes the point that that passage is making, sometimes people say, well, yeah, but or are you sure, right? And so there's a little bit of a time in that section of 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 proving this point, right? Proving this point from the rest of scripture, because maybe it's like, ah, are you getting this right? Well, yeah, actually throughout other places of scripture is saying the same thing. This is agreeing with this and whatnot, or in life, you, you actually see how this does work out, right? The truth of this passage is working out. And so you're, you're sort of proving the point that that passage particularly is, is, is making. And then, uh, and then also too, there's that application that so what, so to speak, of, of that passage. And how does that factor into our lives on a day-to-day basis, uh, all be, uh, be it in a particular command that's in that passage or a principle that is important to understand that plays into how we go about living our lives. But uh, explaining, proving, and applying the word of God. Um, I don't know. Uh, David, you got some more things? Yeah, I to think... Say? Uh... One of the things I try to do, especially if I'm in a more familiar text, something that people think they know, um, I will try to come at the text a little bit sideways and see where is this story, where is this text not what we expect. Mm -hmm. So when we were going through Judges, that was kind of easy to do because people Mm -hmm. think they're familiar with the story of Gideon. But actually, if you go through it with a very close reading, looking at verse by verse really carefully, you realize this story isn't what it might have first appeared to be. So we're talking about fleeces, which, you know, very often people think, oh, that's a positive positive example of how, how to discern determine God's will. God's will for your life. You know, But if you read it carefully, on the second round, Gideon says, let me test you just once more with the fleece. And he goes, okay, well, Gideon knew Deuteronomy, or he should have, that you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And we certainly know that from Deuteronomy and also from Jesus' temptation. So let's look at this whole concept of putting out fleeces from a different perspective that maybe we we need to just go back and see. Gideon actually knew God's will. God told him flat out, this is what you're supposed to do. Now go do it. And he's kind of looking for ways. So it puts a different cast on the story from the way that a lot of people remember it from Sunday school and vacation Bible school Mm -hmm. and just coming at it from that point of view. And I think I'm less focused on trying to, I I mean, I want to have an application of some kind, but I'm also less focused on trying hard to do that. I think a lot of times when I go back and I listen to some of the preachers that I listened to, I realized there were five applications in that sermon where God spoke to me, you know, like (laughs) it wasn't just, they preached their five points and they made their big conclusion. And wow, that was awesome. But it was like, wow, I got something out of the first point. And then I got two things out of the second point. And by the time I finished listening to this sermon, which, you know, maybe I listened to it once before and I got something different from it, but just, because it's God's word, it's got that dynamic kind of character to it where we can, you know, let the Holy Spirit do the work. He's the one that has to do it anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we present the word, but the effect of the word is the work of the Holy Spirit. And so instead of trying to second guess exactly what does the Holy Spirit want to say to my congregation? You know, it's like, no, I'm just going to preach the word. The word of God is living and active. I will let the Holy Spirit say, you know, so you pray, give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Yeah. And um, trust that he will do that. This is, that's, you know, the joy of being Calvinists. (laughs) Yes. That uh, we have to be faithful and obedient to do the work. But in the end, the effect, the outcome is in the hands of a sovereign God who is going to work all things for his own glory. So. But I, I guess that does lead to one other, I think, important part, especially with the uniqueness of what David and I do as we work a lot together. 
uh, is be honest to the text. And so one thing that David and I help each other to do is to be honest to that passage. Uh, we'll sort of check each other at various times. Like, you know, uh, are you taking this or am I taking this in a direction that's faithful to the passage? Or is this sort of a good Christian idea that I just wanted to preach to my people uh, that I came up with? Mm-hmm. Right. So you see, my good Christian ideas aren't nearly as fresh and powerful as scripture proclaimed. Right. And, and so uh, there's, there's times where I'm, I'm going in a direction with that sermon and uh, David will challenge me. And like, that's, you know, you can preach that if you want, it's just, that's not what this passage is saying, <laughs> you know, and it's like, you know, I had to, I have to, I've had to check myself a few times. And, uh, and, and I would say that we have kept each other honest to the scriptures by working together in that kind of a way. Uh, be honest to the scriptures. Uh, not just what do you want that passage to say, but what is that passage saying? And then preach that. Yeah. Amen. Well, we're wrapping up here and we always give our, our guests an opportunity to kind of have a final word. And I already kind of alluded to this. We have pastors and elders and deacons and lay people all listening to this podcast. So if each of you want to give a a short little final word to our listeners, uh, what would you want to leave them with? You go first. I'll go first, I guess. Uh, you know, uh, one of the thoughts with this podcast, as I understood, is that we wanted to kind of talk, a l- highlight a little bit of our unique working relationship with uh, preparing sermons together. Um, I'd encourage uh, uh, pastors, speaking specifically more to the pastors, uh, to give it a shot um, of trying to do a sermon series uh, with another pastor. Uh, just just try it out with just one sermon series and don't commit to saying, this is what we're going to do now. Let's start a relationship like this. But just just do it with a, you know, a 10 part sermon series, go through a letter or something like that and see how it goes. Uh, give it a rip and uh, see what happens. And uh, and it might go quite well for you. Uh, also, too, uh, you know, just to remind uh, one of the neat things about it is it sort of can create a, a bit of a pulpit, uh, a preaching break. As well, if you say, hey, uh, we're going to swap these, if you got 10 sermons uh, out of, you know, a, a couple of these passages, um, I'll preach in your church and then I'll preach in my church uh, a couple times as well. So that takes away some of that burden through the week of preparing a new sermon once in a while. So, yeah, that's, uh, I guess, what I'd say. I was just thinking of the text that um, I seem to recall being read um at my ordination, I'm just going to go with that. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Re- reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. And I guess I could go on. The time is coming, Paul says, when people will not endure sound teaching. Um, I think he was referring to something that happened back then, but that time has been with us all along and i think the answer to that today and always is preach the word that's all we have for this week stay tuned next week for our conversation with juan sierra but until then don't forget this is christ church and he bought it with his blood and we've been warned that wolves will come in trying to destroy the flock so keep a close watch on your life and on your doctrine Preach the word in season and out of season and keep fighting the good fight in this messy reformation.